Good morning and welcome to worship. This is May 23rd, 2021. Hey, it's Pentecost Sunday. In some circles, Pentecost is known as the birthday of the church. And so, happy birthday, church. We will read today of the disciples gathered together when God's Spirit flowed out like a flood of mercy and grace, empowering fearful disciples, giving speech to tongues of those tongue-tied apostles, opening doors that were closed, breaking chains and prison bars that were locked and secured, calling unexpected people to live into God's love. You know, I pray the same may happen today and move in this church in our day, in the midst of all of our society's problems, that the church may be a force of healing, mercy, and love. And so we cry out for the Spirit to come when the world divides us. Come, Holy Spirit, make us one. When the world leaves us as orphaned. Come, Holy Spirit, make us family. When the world leads us astray. Come, Holy Spirit, call us home. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and fill this place. Bring unity, community, and hope to us and to our world. Let us pray. Mighty God, you breathe life into our bones and your spirit brings truth into the world. Send us this spirit, transform us by your truth and give us language to proclaim your gospel. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, amen. Pentecost, we've already called it the birthday of the church today. There may not be cake, but we do tend to celebrate. 
Probably the people among us who are the best at celebrating are our children. If there are children in your household, it's time to make sure they're with us as we welcome Pastor Scott Fielder with a children's message. Good morning, Pastor Scott. Hey everyone at New Hope, it's Pastor Scott Fielder and you know what that means. It's that time in our service for our children's message. So if we have any young people listening, please come close. Make sure that you can hear because this message is especially for you, but of course it is for everyone. And I know you're going to recognize what this is because we've been uh, walk we've been learning about them and using them for you know all this past year during the pandemic, right? This is a mask. And I'm sure one thing that you've learned um, or maybe even heard about, you know, one of the things that masks really help with is when you're sick to keep it from uh, you from maybe passing that on to someone else. And do you know what that means when you are you know sick? Maybe if you've ever had a cold before, um, do you know what it means when you can give that to someone else? There's a really fancy word for it. Um, you might have heard it before. It's called contagious. You know, when you're contagious, it means you can give something that you have to someone else. And often we do hear that word being used when it comes to things like having the cold or you know having the flu or something like that. And um, you know, so it's kind of seen in maybe like a bad way. Um, because those things are, you know, not great to have and they're not fun. But um, contagious can also be used as a word that's, you know, something positive. Because think about it. What if you have something that maybe you do want to spread on, you know, to other people? What if there's something like a, you know, sort of gift that you have that, um, you know, you can share with other people? And uh, I bring this up because in our gospel reading, um, or sorry, in our Bible reading um, in Acts, we're uh, talking about the, the Pentecost story. Um, where the Holy Spirit comes in and sort of has this big sweeping effect and big change, um, you know, amongst all of these people all at once. And it's this really exciting story that we get to hear about uh, every year. And it's something that Jesus, you know, kind of talks about in his ministry, you know, how to recognize the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit is acting. And then how can we use that to, you know, be contagious in a good way, you know, to spread the whole, the love of God and the Holy Spirit uh, with other people. And I know for me, one of the things that, um, you know, I always think of uh, when I'm thinking, where is God's Holy Spirit? How is it working? And it's when um, just something happens that's really incredible, that's really positive, And all of a sudden, I just look back after it's done and I just think, wow, that was really amazing. And that was actually a really incredible thing to be a part of. So think about when you have those moments, you know, maybe it's in a large group of people or maybe it's a one on one moment you have with someone you care about. Um, you know, there's some amazing moments that ha can happen and maybe we don't know God's Holy Spirit is working in that moment. But oftentimes when the experience is over, we can look back and then we can use that feeling and maybe even that story that we've experienced to spread God's love and to share the story of how God's Spirit works in our lives so that others can maybe recognize the Holy Spirit in their own lives. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit and for uh, the, the work that it does in our lives. It gives us uh, life. It gives us passion. It gives us meaning. Uh, continue to help it to drive us as we continue to live out our faith every day because of what your son Jesus Christ did for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our reading comes from the book of Acts, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound, like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native tongue of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? 
But others sneered and said, ah, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men will all see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Wind of the Spirit, so fresh as we worship and fill us with hope every day. Breath of creation. Holy Gospel for this Pentecost Sunday is taken from the 15th and the 16th chapters of the Gospel according to St. John. Jesus told his disciples, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you've been with me from the beginning. But I have said these things to you so that there, when the hour comes, you may remember that I told you about them. I did not say these things to you from the beginning, because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me, about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of Truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I think you'll agree, wouldn't it be great to be in Jesus' presence? I mean, most Christians say that's what they're most looking forward to, right, in heaven, is to be in Jesus' presence. True for me. So it's kind of remarkable then, really, <laughs> at least in our gospel reading today, that Jesus doesn't feel the same way. Now, before you jump to conclusions, let me tell you what he says. Jesus told the disciples that it was better that he goes away so that the Spirit, the Advocate, can come. If you are physically present, right? Visible. 
the focus would have been on Christ. You know, over there, there's Jesus. Or over there, there's Jesus. But because of his absence, we discover the Spirit right here in us, within. And that's the message of Pentecost, is that Jesus is now with us right here, within. Jesus describes the Spirit as another comforter. Did you catch that? Another teacher, another guide. Not him, it's another, but another like him, but one available to absolutely everyone, always, everywhere. The same Spirit who had descended like a dove on Jesus will descend upon us, he promised. The same Spirit who filled him will be the Spirit that fills our hearts also. But for those disciples, the first thing required at Pentecost was letting go of Jesus, at least the physical Jesus, so that they could receive who and what he had promised them. The church commemorates Ascension Day. It was last week, and the day that Jesus ascended into heaven. And, and now today is the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Easter, when the Holy Spirit descends upon the early church gathered together in the upper room and sets them free. Over the last seven weeks during the season of Easter, we've been looking at lives changed by the risen Christ. Some of those folks, you'll remember, have had to let go of fear, some have had to let go of doubt and the pain of the past, and some have had to let go of insecurity or pride. Others have had to let go of power and position or prestige. Some had to let go of the way they understood things like success or failure. Some had to leave go of familiar things, old things that had defined them. St. Paul knows all about this. He writes about it in Philippians 3, for example, where he says, Whatever gains I had, these I've come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. St. Paul knew that the first movement of the Spirit in him was to leave go. Paul never saw Jesus in the flesh. He did have an experience of the risen Christ spiritually present with him. The Spirit of Christ encountered him on the road to Damascus. And that Spirit was enough to transform him from a proud and violent agitator of hostility into a tireless activist for reconciliation. For Paul, life in the Spirit means a threefold sharing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. First, as we turn from old habits and patterns, Paul said, our old self, with all of its pride and greed and lust and anger and prejudice and hostility, all that dies with Christ. We nail it to the cross. All our former identities and all their hostilities are, are left behind, nailed to the cross. In this way, life in the Spirit involves a profound experience of letting go of what has been so far. Then Paul says, we join in the powerlessness and defeat of the burial of Jesus, symbolized for you and me as baptism. We experience that burial as a surrender to silence, stillness, powerlessness, emptiness. It's, a, it's not just a letting go, it's a, it's a letting be, one author said. Paul will say, for we have died and our lives are hidden in God in Christ. So what rises then is not myself, not a re renovated vision of who I am, but my rights and my entitlements and my desires, but what rises then after that burial, after that letting go and letting be, can be Christ. Then we join in Jesus in the dynamic, surprising uprising of resurrection. The surrender, the silence, the emptiness of letting go and letting be make us receptive to new things like a vacuum. This receptivity of letting go and letting be welcomes infilling and activation. And so the experience of letting come, the Spirit of God. The Bible describes the Spirit in, in lots of ways. Beautiful, vivid imagery. Think about them all though. What do they have in common? Wind, breath, fire, clouds, water, 
wine, and a dove. Well, all of those things, you know, move, don't they? They flow, they, they change like a flood. The Spirit's movement in us is letting go, letting be, letting come, reshaping the landscape, dislodging unmovable objects and making us ready for new growth. Letting go, letting be, letting come the Spirit of Jesus into, into the church does surprising things. If we think about the New Testament, especially those who are now living in the presence of the Spirit after Pentecost, the rules have really changed, right? The, the unacceptable people are now embraced. The outsiders have a home and a family called the church. Ancient enemies are brought together as brothers and sisters. The untouchable are held and brought to healing. The broken are mended. The shame-filled are given a place of honor. And the early church could hardly keep up with what the Spirit was doing way out in advance of the church. They had to let go of things. They had to let be. And they had to let the Spirit move in them in order to keep up with what the Spirit's doing. Are, are we ready for such a thing? Are you ready for such a thing? Are you letting go? Are you letting be? Are you letting the Spirit move in you, renovating your life, your commitments, bringing down all your security idols that we form for ourselves, bringing reconciliation into relationships? You know, that always really messes up the old grudges by bringing a newfound kind of love, bringing healing where we had lost hope. It's a revolutionary movement of God's grace like a flood renovates the landscape. In this case, the landscape of our lives and relationships. I'm not sure if I'm ready. I'm not sure that we're ready to let go, to let be and let come the flood of God's movement. We're, we're fighting everything these days, aren't we, in an age of outrage. Everything makes us so angry. You remember a game, a game when we were kids. It was, it was the finger cuffs, the finger, finger trap. It was a cylinder woven of bamboo. Remember, and you'd, you'd put your fingers in it, and then as you tried to pull back, the instinct was to pull back. And if you pulled back, they just locked on. And then you couldn't get your fingers out. And the more you pulled, the more the bamboo would stretch and then tighten down on your fingers. And the, the only key to that was to do what your impulses didn't want you to do. The impulse was to pull back. But to get free, you had to move toward the center. Loosen the bamboo, and then you could slide your finger gently out of it. You know, the upside-down nature of God's kingdom, the let go, the let be, the let come nature of the Spirit seems to be lost now in the modern church. We're just pulling our fingers on that trap and tightening things down that's grip on us. We just seem to be so tight about absolutely everything. You know? I think sometimes we, we've kind of got lost in our idolatrousness as church. You know, stuck in the past or drunk with political power, sucking up our rights to gather or, or even to bring weapons into God's sanctuary. Because it's, well, it's your right. We ridicule the sojourner and the immigrant despite the dire warnings against such action in Scripture. We've become masters of judgment, but we're anemic when it comes to transformative grace, ignoring oftentimes the calling as a church to be among the least, responding to the lost and the last and the needy with compassion to, to care for the dying and to care for the grieving. You know, so often we're saying, the show must go on and the power has to be consolidated. In the waters of baptism, though, you lost your rights. Think about it. We say in the waters of baptism, you died to yourself. You belong to Christ. You were emptied so that you could be filled with Christ, not with yourself or your rights. You know, you, you belong to Christ. It's not the other way around. He's not yours. You are His. As He said, you're the branches. He's the true vine. Your rights, mm, not so much. The old country song didn't know how convicting it would be, but it, when it proudly proclaimed that Jesus is my co-pilot, and I think maybe it was Terry and some other members who said, you know, if you've got, the, if you've got Jesus in the co-pilot seat, you should change seats. You're in the wrong seat. Idolater. 
the modern church has a lot of really self-empowered people running around feeling good about their own personal salvation or their way of thinking and, and sure that they'll be taken up when he comes, feeling secure while living with all of their old Adam hatreds and stinginess and bigotries. Actually wanting actually wanting the world to go to hell in a handbasket because of some kind of mistaken reading of the scripture missing every opportunity to live as if Jesus is actually the Lord of their life and not their co-pilot we don't want to miss the opportunity to live in the presence of the God who truly madly deeply loves you and this world remember always church John 3.16, for God so loves the world. He doesn't desire it to, do, to go to hell in a handbasket. He wants redemption and reconciliation. And you and I are a part of that plan, church. He wants us to move in the circles of redemption that the Spirit, when we let go, and let be, and let come, will drive us toward. You know, when a, a large ship enters a deep harbor, it, it takes on board what is called a harbor master. Now this person knows the harbor better than anybody else. They know the length of it. They know the depth of the harbor. They know where the hazards are. They know uh, what the tides are, where the currents are running. They know what directions they flow and they flow in and flow out. How strong they are. They know all those things. When the harbor master comes on board the ship, the harbor master takes control of the ship and gives the order to the captain who steers it. The harbor master is as Jesus said, an other. An outside expert who is brought in to make sure that the safe, that the, the ship moves unencumbered in and out of the harbor. Now, as we sail through the sea of life, we've been given a harbor master too. Jesus said, it's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus knows the currents, the tides, the hazards, the flow. If you let guide the ship into safety he will but also maybe more importantly he will guide you back out of the harbor into the open flow of the ocean where the ship is meant to be I mean that's where ships are supposed to be too often the harbor of the church becomes the safe port and we never leave it imagine if that's what happened in our shipping industry the whole goal is to stay in the port now, that's not what ships are made for, are they? They are meant to sail, not permanently moored and secured to a dock. And that's what our life, church, is to be about. Letting go, letting be, letting come the Spirit to move us like a flood into new areas. When the harbor master is on board, others have to let go, let be, and let the master come and guide the ship. It's the only good, the only safe the only right thing to do. What do you need to let go of then? I'm thinking a lot about that in the last week. What obstacles inwardly or outwardly get in the way of spirit vitality? What secrets fester? What silent biases or grudges, hatred or fear do you have locked up in the cellar of your life? Are, are you willing to put those things to death with Christ on the cross? To let it go? And then to just let it be and not to try to resurrect that from the dead. <laughs> Leave it buried with him. Can you then inhale, open in your emptiness, unlock that inner vacuum and let the spirit enter and fill and to instruct you or as the harbor master to guide you like wind or breath or fire or cloud or wine or dove or a flood of God's mercy and grace. Are you willing to let him come? It's Pentecost. Pentecost. The birthday of the church. The day when the Spirit falls upon those fearful disciples and begins to change absolutely everything. Let's let God's mercy flood into our lives, into our work, into all of our relations. Let it be so. Let it be now. Pentecost. Amen.
wind, wind of the sea. Alive in the risen Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before God, who promises to hear us and answer in steadfast love. Gracious God, you give the Holy Spirit to your church, filling it with many and varied gifts. In the church throughout the world, strengthen us in our visioning and dreaming that we may discover in you the Spirit's creative work. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, your mighty works are too numerous to count. The earth is full of your creation, living things both great and small. Open your hand to give them the necessities of this life. Send your fresh spirit over the face of the earth. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of the nations, at the sound of the rushing wind, people speaking different languages proclaimed and heard together your deeds of power. Fill the leaders of the nations with your Holy Spirit so that they exercise your gracious will in the lives of our people. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of faithfulness, you tend to the needs of your people, even the size of our hearts. Hear those who cry out to you in distress. 
Restore to wholeness all who are in any need this day, especially caregivers. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of love, fill new hope with gratitude for the gifts we have received from you. Renew our ministries, heal our divisions, and open us to the needs of our neighbors. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of hope, those who have died in you raise their eternal song of praise. We give you thanks for the many gifts of your people and rejoice in the witness of your saints. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the hope of new life in Christ, O Lord, we raise our prayers to you, trusting in your never-ending goodness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And together, let us pray that prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. And now may the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.